Hello, everybody. If you are new to our webinar series, welcome, welcome, and thank you for joining us. If you've joined us before, thanks for being here with us again. Today's webinar topic is hidden traps that will derail your CER. Answer these critical questions before you start writing. Our presenter today is Criterion Edge's president, Lori Mitchell. Here's a bit about Lori for those of you who are new. Lori Mitchell is founder and president of Criterion Edge, a global medical and regulatory writing and safety services firm servicing the medical device, pharmaceutical, and biotech industries. Lori has over 20 years of experience in medical writing, safety and pharmacovigilance management, and regulatory reporting. Having provided regulatory and medical writing solutions to many pharma and medical device companies, both large and small, she is a proven leader in designing practical strategies to meet current global regulatory challenges. Lori is a published author and holds Master of Nursing from UCLA. <clears throat> Before you begin, I want to mention a few housekeeping items. If you experience any technical difficulties, please use the chat option on your Zoom menu bar and send us a message. We'll do our best to help you out. If you have any questions about our content today, you don't have to wait until the end. Use the Q&A option in your Zoom menu bar and you can send us your questions really at any point in time. We'll run through all your questions at the very end. And if we don't get to your question, we'll get in touch with you afterwards. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on our website afterwards. You'll also receive an email with the link to the recording as well as the slides. Lastly, I want to encourage all of our attendees today to just hang on with us for a little bit longer after we finish the webinar for a super short two question survey. Your feedback to us will be really helpful. Before I turn it over to Lori, let's just quickly warm up our fingers and take a quick minute for a poll question that's gonna pop up on your screen right now. <clears throat> the question is, currently how aligned are your internal processes and documents, quality system, tech file, risk PMS management, clinical evaluation process, et cetera, with MDR requirements? And I'll just give you guys a second to finish answering. Great, thank you everyone for responding to that. It looks like a lot of you feel like you're, you're still, it's st still a work in progress and you still have gaps you need to resolve. So thank you for responding. Um, all, right, all right, Lori, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you, Jessica. Hi everyone, thanks for attending. In our session today, this presentation will provide practical tips on how to assess for hidden traps and unexpected roadblocks that could impact the success of writing an MDR compliant CER. By performing a gap analysis and assessing the readiness and availability of critical resources, documents, and expertise, you will be able to anticipate and even avoid project delays and discover efficiencies that will enable the on-time completion of a successful MDR compliant CER. At the end of this presentation, you will know the importance of scoping your CER project in advance, the critical inputs needed to enable the success of your CER, and the impact to the project if these inputs are not available or incomplete. And lastly, how to identify those hidden gaps in resources and information <clears throat> and the steps to take to mitigate them. Uh, one additional housekeeping item, these days, most of us are working from our home environments and thus may have friendly four-legged office assistants that will weigh in with their opinion from time to time on Zoom calls. I too have an office assistant, but she is usually very quiet. However, you may hear the occasional meow. <clears throat> Next slide, Jessica. You and your team have been working and preparing for months or has it been years? on MDR transition activities. You've tackled your tech file, updated documents, installed new processes and quality systems. There have been endless cross-functional meetings held to discuss and mitigate every contingency. Surely you and your team have thought of everything, right? But my guess is it's an alternate question that keeps you up at night. What haven't you thought of? 
<clears throat> I know there are endless ways we could tackle this topic today, but I want to focus on something that we at Criterion Edge know quite a bit about, the clinical evaluation report. Our team of scientists, writers, project managers know you are the subject matter expert on your device, no question. But we consider ourselves to be subject matter experts on the CER, the report itself what it takes to pull together all the background information, device description, conduct literature reviews and extract relevant data, manage and analyze multiple data sets, and ultimately and successfully tell the story of the clinical evaluation process of your device. I often say the CER has one job, just one. It must present sufficient evidence that demonstrates the safety and performance as intended of the medical device under evaluation. It's a straightforward statement of intent, yet we all know the clinical evaluation process is incredibly complex and full of unexpected and unanticipated surprises. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Some of those surprises that maybe you haven't thought of yet as you prepare to write a CER. I present the analogy of the CER as a Jenga tower assembled from many parts and when properly built must stand on its own. But of course, like the Jenga tower, a CER can only be as strong and stable as its weakest part and could ultimately fail to effectively demonstrate safety and performance if information is missing or not properly developed or presented. My suggestion is to start by borrowing a page from MedDev 2.7 slash 1 Rev 4 which tells us that the first step in the clinical evaluation process is scoping. So I'm not talking about scoping at the macro level, the department level. You, my suggestion is to approach this exercise at the project level, the CER itself. Therefore, ask yourself, what inputs are needed to write the CER? When are they needed by? And finally, will they be ready on time? Approach these scoping questions as a gap analysis exercise. Begin by identifying and assessing the critical elements needed to support the clinical evaluation process. For example, your regulatory strategy. Is it final? Have decisions been made with respect to device groupings or device families within one CER? This is a pivotal decision that must be finalized early, certainly before a CER can ever be started. And by the way, without a doubt, this decision hinges entirely around the question of equivalence amongst the product family devices. Next, what is the status of all necessary inputs to the CER, the data? All clinical data sources, such as clinical investigation data, data derived from PMS activities, and the systematic literature, uh, literature review of clinical data. That's the data I'm talking about. Are critical input documents that are needed early in the CER process, such as the IFU, are they finalized or are they still being revved? This may create serious timeline issues downstream. And speaking of timelines, are the project timelines verbally established? Have you allowed for enough time to finish the CER or have you built in time to mitigate unexpected changes or roadblocks. Additionally, assess your available resources. Do you have access to solid, reliable MDR document templates, CER, CEP, SSCP, PMCF plan? If you do, how confident are you that they're MDR compliant? In other words, have they been tested through a notified body review of a previously submitted CER, for example? Do you have access to expertise? With regard to CER writers, I can tell you from the experience of our team fixing many a poorly written CER, writing an MDR compliant CER is certainly not a job that's best left to the uninitiated. By the way, uh, the CER requires an extensive focus on the systematic literature review process, search, review, and screening of clinical literature retrieved through a robust literature search not performed on the internet. Do you have access to that specialized expertise? Finally, bandwidth. Do you have access to enough human power with the availability to do the job of compiling documents, 
performing the literature search, screen, and selection process, writing, reviewing, and QCing a 250 plus page CER, for example. <clears throat> Next slide, Jessica. Here's a schematic of some of the key inputs on developing into developing a successful CER. You can see many elements are required to work in harmony to support a fully developed CER. First, I want to give a special shout out to the importance of risk management inputs. They are a critical component that help the CER writer tie everything together as a part of the conclusion and final analysis. An early and honest assessment of the sufficiency of the clinical data. This is probably the first key assessment to undertake with your team. The development of GSPRs, the safety and performance objectives are a mandatory early step to complete at the beginning of the CER process. The state of the art section, the clinical literature section and screening are 100% dependent on well-developed and final, final, safety and performance objectives. But this presentation today will focus on the other four elements, tech file readiness, templates, systematic literature review, and bandwidth and expertise. First up, is your tech file ready? Or are there outstanding documents yet to be finalized or pending decisions to be made? What are some of the criti critical documents in your tech file that have a direct impact on CER development if they're not ready? Here are a few examples. We've already talked about some of these documents all, you know, earlier, but let's look at them again. The IFU. Bottom line, the information in the IFU literally touches every part of the CER. If that document is being revved, or even worse, in danger of needing updates during the CER writing process, you must build in extra time for your writers. Changes to the IFU implemented midstream during the writing process cost many hours of a writer scrubbing through the partially written CER to find every sentence that needs updating. In short, it's a writer's nightmare. PMS, PMCF plans, and or the reports. I mentioned these reports and documents for several reasons. It seems that at times these documents are underdeveloped uh, or sometimes missing altogether, such as the PMCF plan, or in need of a serious overhaul. For example, sometimes we receive the PMS data in raw form, essentially presented in huge spreadsheets that require an enormous number of hours on the part of the writer to manually compile the data into CER ready tables. Remember your PMS data represents a major source of clinical data on the safety of the device. The device must, the, the data, I'm sorry, the data set must be weighted and appraised just like all other clinical data sources, the clinical investigation data, the clinical literature data, and it must be properly presented and analyzed. Not being CER ready can impact your deliverable timeline. Clinical investigation data held by the manufacturer. Are the data final or do you need to wait for a data cut that could create a potential timeline impact? We're gonna to talk today a lot about time. Uh, you're gonna hear it a lot from me. Non-clinical data. This can be an often overlooked source of project delays. Are there additional design validation or other non-clinical testing underway that may create unanticipated project delays or last minute CER rewrites because of a late breaking re uh, revision? Lastly, what critical internal decisions are still outstanding? <clears throat> Will they affect CER development? For example, some critical decisions regarding labeling may not have an impact on the CER. Those decisions can be reached in parallel with CER development and aren't, aren't necessarily rate limiting to the writing of the CER. However, as I've already mentioned, making foundational strategy changes, such as product line changes or device groupings 
even adding or removing devices after the CER has started, can have far-ranging impact, impact not only to the quality of the CER and to literature review screening decisions, et cetera, all of which result in project delays, <coughs> excuse me, and budget overrun. I thought I would include a little cause and effect scenario here that arises out of manufacturer decisions that lead to changes in tech file documents, which then of course lead to impacts to the CER. Let's say there's been a strategic regulatory decision made to extend the indication of a medical device and get that indication approved as part of an upcoming MDR update. That's a, that's a common scenario. <clears throat> that indication change impacts many critical documents that feed directly into the CER such as the IFU, PMS, and risk management, and may even require possible updates to non-clinical and design validation documents. In this scenario, the impact really to the CER is global. GSPRs, state-of-the-art, data analysis, just to name a few. Further impact might be to the grouping of devices within a CER, perhaps because this indication change, because of this indication change, one or more devices may need to be moved out of the product family to avoid equivalence issues, sometimes creating a new standalone CER. In other words, two CER projects have now been created where once there was one. Now, let's dive into the important role of templates in preparing the documents required for MDR compliance. <clears throat> Think of a good template as a roadmap that will help usher your document across the MDR finish line. Have you given much thought to the importance and impact of a solid MDR compliant template? Many people focus on the CER template, but you should consider developing additional templates for the CEP, PMCF, PMS plans, and the SSCP. Yes, you may have a temp template you've used for past MDD CERs, but of course that won't be adequate for MDR submission. If you do have templates developed, does the template guide that story process I keep referring to in a CER? If you, here's a test. If you sat down and read just the template, would it still make sense and flow logically? For the CER template, it should start at the beginning by setting the stage with the state of the art, and then the story flows from there. It should culminate in the big finale, the conclusion where you tell the reviewer that yes, indeed, this CER has demonstrated that your device is safe, does perform as intended, and thus meets all MDR requirements for safety and performance. Does a template include all MDR required elements? One great advantage for you would be if the template has already been pressure tested by having gone through a notified body review. If it has, then I'm sure you've re you received great feedback that was then incorporated into the template for future CER. If it hasn't, then it's really just hypothetical that that template would pass notified body scrutiny. Proceed with caution and do your due diligence by carefully assessing the template for all required MDR elements and ask yourself if it flows, it's logical, and it tells the story. Keep this in mind. Keep this tip in mind. Remember, you should assume that notified body reviewers are overworked, tired, distracted, and probably hungry and sleep deprived. If they have to work hard at reviewing your CER because it's poorly written, disjointed, underdeveloped, or missing key information, they might get even more cranky and begin to distrust, distrust the entire document and its contents. Needless to say, that's a tough place to find yourself in with your notified body reviewer, and you would want to avoid that scenario at all costs. A great template can help keep that from happening. <clears throat> but relying on templates that are untested or poorly constructed can create downstream delays 
cost overruns to fix poorly written CERs, and perhaps worst of all, costly delays in MDR approval for critical devices within your product portfolio. <clears throat> Next, let's talk about the systematic literature review. Do you have the resources and expertise to tackle this task? The systematic literature review is a clear and methodologically sound plan for the identification, retrieval, selection, appraisal, and weighting of published data. Systematic review methodology is nothing new. It has long been the gold standard process for evidence-based research, especially in the academic and professional arenas. Those same rigorous principles have now been mandated by global regulatory authorities and are adopted by pharmaceutical, medical device, and IV manufacturers as best practice. When assessing your capabilities to perform this robust MDR mandata mandated systematic literature review, ask these questions as a part of your gap analysis. Do you have access to an experienced librarian? to design a robust search strategy using MeSH search syntax? Do you have access to a search platform that can accommodate that advanced search uh, MeSH search terminology and search protocols? This is definitely not the internet, which does not accommodate the complex syntax structure of the literature search and can only recognize the and, and or MeSH search terms. Do you have access to the minimally expected databases for these types of searches, which is typically Embase and Medline, Embase and Medline? And finally, once you get the search results, those, resor those results must be screened by humans. Do you have that bandwidth? In our experience, a typical turnaround time for clinical literature search preparation, conducting a minimum of two searches for each CER, and screening all the references returned from those searches is easily a four to six week process from beginning to end. Have you built enough time into your project plan? Do you have enough bandwidth to accomplish what is often an enormous resource heavy task? Expertise, or more to the point, the lack of expertise to do the work can derail even the best plans and preparation. Let's talk more about that. <clears throat> to make a project work, I think we might all be familiar with this, this analogy taken from the Good to Great book by Jim Collins, get the right people on your team and put them in the right seat on the bus. Your internal team are all subject matter experts on the device, as I said, and thus the documents, data, and information needed to write the clinical evaluation report. They each have their specific role to play in their specific specialty, be it regulatory affairs, clinical affairs, quality, research and development, project management, et cetera. But who among your team are the right people to be assigned the task of preparing, supporting, and pushing along the CER to completion? Which leads to the next point, and again, borrowing from Jim Collins' analogy in the book, Let's assume you have great people, but are they each sitting in the right seat on the bus? Are their skills and talents deployed effectively to the rest to, to the correct task? For example, Sally is a great scientist, very knowledgeable in the device and a great analytical thinker. But does she have the right skills to effectively lead the CER team? John is a very experienced is very experienced in regulatory affairs and his guidance and leadership in this area is invaluable to the team. Maybe he seems to be the best fit to compile the CER and he might have the bandwidth to take on the project, but can he write, analyze data? And here's a skill that's often overlooked. Is he an expert in using Word? Because the complexities of an MDR compliant CER require some pretty advanced Word skills from the writer. This is the time to honestly assess the resources you have on hand, identify the gaps, and find ways to fill those gaps. Select the right people, put them in the right seat, and where gaps exist, 
whether it's in bandwidth or focused expertise, act early to fill those gaps. My final point is that it takes a village to pull together a successful, well-written MDR compliant CER. Partnerships are critical in the success of any task, but certainly to one as monumental as the CER. Partner with your internal cross-functional colleagues across departments. Form partnerships within your own team and partner with a great external resource such as a consultant or vendor if needed. Great partnerships are greater than the sum of their parts and can lead to great outcomes. And lastly, time, the master of us all. I thought I would wrap up the session today with final thoughts about time. You've certainly heard me talk about it. There are two measures of time represented here. On the left, the number of calendar days remaining to the final project due date. On the right, a representation of the days, hours, and minutes needed to complete a task. When a certain deliverable is coming due, I always assess the time remaining from these two points of view how many hours are needed to complete the work, and how many calendar days do we have to do it? So before we move into our Q&A session, I'll leave you with these two humble bits of advice. If you think a CER writing task will take two weeks to complete, double that. If you're sure that everything will be ready for the CER project to start on November 1st, plan on a start date of November 15th. My final advice for preparing a CEO project is straightforward. Do not underestimate the importance and the need for time. Thank you everyone for your time and attention today. I'm really looking forward to your questions. I'll hand it back to Jessica now. Jessica? Thanks, Lori. Uh, we hope at, at this point you were able to understand how to assess your CER project for unanticipated roadblocks and delays using the gap analysis approach, uh, which inputs have the greatest impact on the success of the CER, how still evolving decisions and incomplete documents can negatively affect CER uh, negatively impact, excuse me, CER quality and timelines, and why early intervention and mitigation of these unexpected issues can help ensure the success of the project. If not, this is a time for you to start sending us your questions. I see that we have a few already, so please continue to send us your questions. And if you do have follow-up <coughs> questions after this webinar, you can always reach out to Lori. Our contact information will be in the conclusion site that'll show up in a, in a little bit, so just hang on a bit longer with us. If you'd like to know more about our services and want to schedule some time to talk to Lori, uh, let us know and we'd be glad to set that up for you. Um, and if you're a company that has IVD products, we'll be doing a very similar topic um, and approach it from the point of view of IVDR readiness and how you can do the same type of gap analysis internally. Lori, I'm going to set up a screen for you uh, so we can start our Q&A. While I set that up, um, I'd like our attendees to just take another quick poll question for us. Um, and it should be showing up on your screen um, right about now. The question is, what are the biggest challenges faced by you or your company for MDR readiness? And you can choose more than one, so please choose all that apply to you. Just gonna give another minute to let everybody finish answering. <clears throat> okay, thanks everybody. Um, it looks like People resources have uh, is quite the majority of the answers. Thanks everybody for answering that question for us. And I will get right into the Q and A. Lori, can you see my screen? I can. Okay, great. Uh, the first question is: What is expected in terms of the state of the art content? Well, that is a big question. That's a that's a global question, but an extremely important one. I would say uh, quickly 
that the state of the art you heard me say is it t needs to tell a story. It needs to start with the clinical, the involved clinical conditions, the patient population, the epidemiology, and it needs to. So think of this SO, the SOA is what I call it as a funnel. It starts broad. It starts broad about here's the landscape of the of the patients, the epidemiology, the clinical conditions. It moves down into specific therapeutic options for those and descriptions of those clinical conditions and the therapeutic options available to the, um, to the uh, uh, patients, uh, involved patients. So that's sort of at the middle of the funnel. And now you're beginning to introduce in that section your device as a potential or your device's technology as a potential therapeutic option for the treatment of the condition and the patient. And then you move into the last of the funnel is that you specifically talk about that therapeutic option and your, your device and your competitors. You're talking now about your technology and any competitors that offer the same technology, how it works, why it works, and how it's used. And then an often overlooked part of the state of the art is that that is where you set, you move, there's one more step. You move now into the analysis of competitor clinical data, not your device data, competitor clinical data. Because what you're pulling out now is you're establishing the um, acceptance criteria for the performance and safety objectives of similar, you're, you're establishing the state of the art. You're establishing what are the state of the art standards for devices such as yours um, for performance and safety. And that usually happens in the state of the art. And then from there, those performance and acceptance criteria filter out throughout the rest of the CER as you now pivot to your subject device and its clinical data, and you compare that clinical data back to the state of the art. That's what I mean by flow. That's how a CER flows logically. I hope that helped. Thanks, Lori. The next question is, is equivalence mandatory if there is not a direct comparative device? Equivalence is mandatory when and if you judge that there is not sufficient clinical evidence to establish the safety and performance of your subject device. That's as it, it is no more complicated than that, really. If you take an honest assessment, and I think I mentioned that even in the one of the slides, if you do an honest assist assessment early on of your clinical data sources for your subject device, and you deem the that those data insufficient to establish both safety and performance as intended, then you must consider uh, establishing an equivalence with a device that does have sufficient data to establish safety and performance. Because when you establish equivalent, it's a one for all, all for one, A equals B. The data from the, the equivalent comparator becomes the data that underpins and establishes the safety of your own device because you've just proven that they're equivalent. Okay. Thanks, Lori. Next question up is: Should there uh, should there be more than one resource for literature searches? Well, if by resource we mean more than one database search, if that's what we mean here, then um, again, that is stronger. I I can't emphasize enough that that with the clients that we work with, and we've been lucky enough to work with some. Uh, uh, some leading clients in, in the um, industry from the beginning, before there was, before MDR was even announced. Um, we've seen the evolution of the notified body thinking and their focus. And I can tell you that from our experience, we see a lot of scrutiny paid to the systematic literature review, a lot. Um, it is the source, it is a lot, it is a major source of clinical real world evidence data on your device. And uh, they want to be very certain that your 
systematic literature review process from beginning to end is methodologically robust and does not introduce bias in the selection of clinical data. So the more, the more transparent and reproducible you can be with and, and thorough, you can be with that result, with that process, uh, the, the happier, apparently, your notified body reviewer may be. I hope that helps too. Okay. Next question up is, is CDP a standalone document? Are there guidances for it? Um, the CDP, a clinical development plan, um, we're beginning to see that with our clients. We've actually written many of them. We went through a big cadence at the end of uh, last year, uh, writing a, a bunch of CDPs uh, that feed into cl clinical development plan plan plans that feed into product families and devices and so forth. Um, we did not, uh, um, at the time, a look at uh, any guidances for it. it. It seemed to be an internal document and uh, was thus, then we, we followed the direction of our client. All righty. Our next question is, if we have sufficient clinical data from published sources, do we still need to have an equivalent device? I think I just answered that, and the answer is no. If you think you have sufficient clinical data from any source, any source, clinical manufacturer health data as is PMS and clinical investigation data, and certainly um, published sources, uh, then. But I, I can't. I can't define what sufficient is. This is a. This is I know a struggle, uh, an internal struggle amongst the team of every company we have worked with is when it's on the edge. Sometimes it's a slam dunk. There's plenty of evidence. Um, and other times if it's on the edge, I know, I know you all struggle with how, how is it enough? Do, do, can, we, can we make the argument? And that's where a good writer comes in to be able to help you make that, that argument. All right, thanks, Lori. Next question, is CDP and CEP the same? CDP is a clinical development plan, which then describes the, um, the genesis, if you will, of, of that particular device within your company and, and the investigations that it's gone through and its development, both clinical and, and non-clinical, um, throughout the process. And then what the plan is, the indication and so forth, and any kind of research plan or uh, other kind of development. A CEP is the Clinical Evaluation Plan, which is a part of the, um, uh, the grouping of MDR-ready uh, documents that you should have at the ready when you do MDR submissions. The Clinical Evaluation Plan is the plan that describes your clinical evaluation process that you are following in the Clinical Evaluation Report. Okay. The next question is, should the RBA be quantitative or can it be qualitative? Ooh, that's a, that's a, there's a question. Um, well, okay, this is an opinion. Uh, you know, I am certainly not the world's expert on um, uh, the risk benefit analysis. I would say a couple of things that jump out at me is that data should be as quantitative as possible. Um, it, that's strong data. In other words, when you're looking at data sets, um, whether it's your analysis of your risk in your risk benefit analysis or any data set that you're using, your part of that assessment is the weighting and appraisal of that data set. And part of that weighting and appraisal is that higher levels of evidence are RCT trials, you know, that, that high, highly developed quantitative data analysis, quantitative data. When your data is qualitative, which to me means case reports, um, other types of user uh, info, uh, written words, uh, th then it becomes weaker data. 
So I would say try to avoid that. Even if you're using some of your uh, data that you're collecting uh, through, say, PMS channels or PMCF channels, um, even if it's qualitative in that you're asking a user survey, how, what was your, ask the questions very specifically and make it something like, make the response not an open-ended text, but like a Likert scale, a one to five Likert scale. That becomes quantitative. It's, it's not robust, but at least it's quantitative. So that's my response to that. All right. Um, here's a question on the state of the art. Where would you put state of the art analysis in this process? Do you believe this is needed before finalizing CEP? Ah, this gets, I think this gets to the question of where does the CEP start and the CER begin? And what do we need to put in the CEP? So different, manu different clients of ours, different manufacturers, I think approach this a little differently. Here's one thing about the CEP. Data does not belong in a CEP. A CEP should not have data in it. It's a plan, it's not a report. So having said that, um, the CEP, however, should describe at a, at a relatively high level, your approach in the state of the art for that particular device, because the CEP is is specific to the CER. They go their hand their their twin documents, and um, so therefore the CEP is when we're asked by a client to can you write us a CEP a CER a PMCF plan all of that we begin with the CEP because it's a planning document. We we begin concurrently with the CER because there's a lot of work to be done on the CER but the CEP needs to be fleshed out. So with regards to the state of the art analysis, yes, it should be described in the CEP um, with enough detail that the notified body reviewer can look at your both documents and say, yep, here in the CER, they're really following their plan. They're, they're doing what they said they were going to do. So that's, that, those are, um, that's my thought on that question. Okay, uh, next question for you. Um, if you don't have access to a librarian, can an experienced writer be sufficient for MDR CER? Well, so if your experienced writer knows how to write complex um, search syntax and has a platform in which they can publish that, and often that's from academic, often our, our clients have academic resources that have access to a more robust platform um, to send to to do that literature search. But I, I want to repeat what I've said is that if this is a straight internet search, uh, PubMed only, uh, the uh, a notified body will question that. And here's why they'll question that. They may question it. And here's why. Because from, the, from what I understand, from what notified body feedback, the notified body approaches the methodology of the literature search um, through the lens of, is it reproducible? Is it transparent? If I did the exact same thing that's published in the CER exactly, will I get the same or very similar results? And from an internet search or from an inexperienced searcher, that isn't using a, the structure of a mesh-based search protocol ser using search syntax, if they're not using that structure, then even a slight word, I, we just did an M MDR, uh, an IVDR, I mean, um, uh, a webinar a few weeks ago. And part of the way that we illustrated this was that we put side by side a, a, the, you know, kind of the search protocol from using mesh syntax. And then we compared it to internet searches and even compared two different internet searches and changing one word in the internet search, actually making it a plural, like, um, I don't know, but making it a plural, changed the number of hits that you got on an internet search simply by changing one of your keywords from singular to plural. It, it changed it from 58 responses to 358 responses. That's the kind of thing that the notified bodies don't like to see. They don't like to see that that wild variation. So um, 
an experienced writer usually doesn't have the background to or the tools available to run a sufficient um, literature search for MDR compliance. Thanks, Lori. A quick reminder to all the attendees, please continue to send your questions in the Q&A option so we can uh, field them. Thanks. Your next question is, approximately how long does it take mm -hmm. to prepare this ER? <laughs> well, uh, ideally, uh, uh, yes. Okay, so there's many caveats. I'll try to make this as simple as possible. Um, you know, with a well-prepared uh, client, where most everything is in place. Uh, perhaps there's not a lot of complexity to the um, arguments. Uh, perhaps there's not an equivalence section that we have to wrangle over. Um, you know, we can do a, a CER in three months, uh, comfortably, if it's pretty straightforward. Most of them are not straightforward. And uh, the more complex they become, it becomes more like a four month project. If you held a gun to my head and I then held a gun to my <laughs> team's head, perhaps, perhaps we could get it done in 10 weeks, but nothing short of that. It's just too complex. And again, thank you for asking that question because what did I emphasize through this entire presentation time time and time it is your enemy if you don't give yourself enough of it it is the enemy to a successful outcome uh speaking of time i wanted to bring up this question if time is not under your control how do you manage this okay so <laughs> I, I don't know but I can tell you, I can tell you this. Let, let's let's talk about a little strategies. If time is not under your control, that, that we hear that from our clients all the time. Well, we're talking now, but gee whiz, we've only got ten weeks to do it. What are we going to do? All right. So what are we going to do? Um, let's problem solve. Um, and now I'm going to talk as a vendor. I'm, I apologize. It's not about a. This is not a sales job, but this is. This, you have to problem solve. You have to look at your resources. So if you have the resource of a vendor, and that vendor, in our case, employs a team model, which means that we have multiple writers working on a CER at the same time. We, this is not a lineal, linear process for us. Somebody may be building the state of the, writing the state of the art section, which is a very standalone section, um, while somebody else is building out the device description section, while somebody else, our, our systematic literature review team, is already working on a state of the art, a uh, uh, state on the um, uh, literature searches. So parallel, parallel um, activities are critical to reducing your the number of days. This gets down to that time. It's like how many days do you have versus how much time does it take to do the work? So if you only have one person working on a CER, you're, you're going to be in a pickle because they can only work so much. But if you have multiple people working on concurrent parts of the CER, then time, calendar days, you can manage your calendar days a little bit um, easier that way. Another vendor, you might also talk to your vendor about focusing on only some parts of the CER while you and your team write other parts. Maybe a vendor can be, um, write some of the harder, quote, harder sections of the CER and be that overarching voice and QC and, and reviewer to make sure everything is, it looks as good as possible. So get creative with time because time is, um, it, it is the, as I said, the master of us all and there's no, and there's no getting around it usually. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lori. Another question here. What is the difference <clears throat> between the SOA and the literature search you mentioned previously? Well, I mentioned too that there, there, there are two literature searches that have to happen in a, in a CER. One literature search is very simple. It's the subject device literature search. You are looking for published data, clinical data on your subject device. That's a standalone search. It's only on your subject device. That exists on its own. 
there's another there's another search though that needs to happen too. And remember what I said about the state of the art and establishing state of the art objectives and acceptance criteria by looking at your devices direct competitors that employ the same technology or very similar technology for outcomes such as um, safety and performance outcomes, uh, you know, that whatever it is, whatever those outcome are, outcomes are that uh, you, you develop for your, um, for your uh, device. So the second search is that search that's competitor device data and also supports uh, the state of the art research for references. So that search is very PICO term driven, patient indication, comparator, and outcome. Whereas the clinical, uh, the, uh, the search for the subject device isn't PICO related. It, you're really just searching for your device's name, essentially. That's what you're looking for. Lots of other searches, search terms to put in there. So that's the big difference. I, I hope that um, answered the question. Thanks, Lori. Our next question, is it mandatory to have an analysis software to present the analysis of clinical data? So by analysis software, uh, so I'm gonna take this in two ways. One is that, is it, is it mandatory to have your biostatistician run you know, your data through SAS software uh, to get that kind of those kind of validated tables that come out, that's very common, of course, in in the scientific side of the house that's doing clinical trials and so forth. Um, it is not mandatory to to do that. Um, if there's AI that we're talking about, artificial intelligence, to do some sort of analysis of the data set, um, we've never employed that, and I've never heard of that or seen that done. This is to me, and I think to the notified body, a very human part of the, um, of the work that needs to go in to the CER, which is the uh, compilation and correct presentation of your clinical data set. It's waiting and appraisal. And then, then you write the story. What, is, what are the data telling you? And you have to follow that analysis to its correct and logical conclusion. Okay, thanks, Sorry, We have a few more minutes, so I'm taking a couple more questions for you. Um, for class one devices, since it follows a non-clinical route of conformity, can we still use literature data to support the safety and performance of the device? Uh, yes, that's a simple question, yes. The more data, here's the story, the more data, the better. Um, data is never a bad thing. So absolutely, yes. Throw everything you've got at it, that as long as it's correct and it holds up under scrutiny. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next question up on the screen, MDR requires the technical file of the competitor device. This is not realistic, so how can you demonstrate equivalence? Well, you cannot demonstrate equivalent unless you, as, as you said, you cannot demonstrate equivalent effectively or realistically and certainly won't pass notified body scrutiny. If you are using a competitor device, you, if you're using a competitor device as the equivalent comparator, equivalence really has to come in um, if you've got a predicate device or another similar device uh, that, can, that, uh, that you own, that, you're, that you, you, the manufacturer own, that's in-house where you have access to the tech file. Uh, and then you have to still create the equivalent argument um, but you've got to have access to that tech file. So uh, demonstrating, this gets down to the, this is a chicken and an egg kind of question. This is why I said the first thing you've got to look at is the sufficiency of your clinical data source. Because if you don't deem it sufficient, then you're going to have to consider equivalence. Uh, and uh, how are you going to manage that? So that that's the, this is, a, this is a strategy that we as writers and a vendor can't help with. It, it, it's, your, it's on you guys, I'm afraid. Right, thank you, Lori. 
Next question. If our device is new on the market, do we have to provide literature search um, on similar devices, for example? Well, if your device is new to the market, if this is again, it gets back to the sufficiency of your clinical data. So if you're doing an MDR submission for a new device, that's never been um, that's never been sold. Essentially, you still need to look at all of your clinical data sources. I assume that there is some sort of manufacturer held data in the form of um, clinical trials or clinical investigations. I would also assume that there's no PMS data since it's not post market yet. But I wouldn't assume that there isn't some sort of clinical data out in the published world. And you, even if you know for a fact there isn't, the MDR requirements require that you look. So here's the, here's the short answer about, we get this question all the time is, but there is no clinical data, or I know there's very little, or you know, nobody writes about a guide wire. But the, but the um, notified bodies require you to make that step. They're satisfied if they see that you went through a methodologically robust systematic literature search, screen, and review, and found nothing. If that's the case, they're, they're, they won't argue with that. But if, if you didn't do that, or your, your search was and, and your uh, process was flawed, then they will might make you do it again because they're not confident in that. But if they are confident in the methodology and confident in the process, and they see just like you do, that there was nothing out there, so be it. That is our experience. Okay. And I think maybe we have time for one or two more questions. How much time would you typically allow for a CEP? Uh, well, we, we get going on the CEP um, relatively early. And again, uh, how pulled together is this is gets back to the whole point of this um, this conversation today is how pulled together is your is your team how have you made all those strategic de decisions is everything in place are there any hidden traps They're, they would be very similar to what we talked about for the CER decisions documents strategy um, if those are all in good shape I, I'd give the CEP and you've got a good template or you're working with someone that has a good template for a CEP, it's a six week-ish project, probably, maybe a little less, if everything goes well and as expected. Again, the big bugaboo with CERs is data. They're, they're just exponentially more complex than a plan. Thanks, Lori. As we are out of time now, so I just wanted to say thank you, Lori, again for just taking some time out for this webinar for just Q and A. I, I think we still have a lot of questions that we didn't quite get to, so we'll be sure to follow up with you guys. If you did enjoy this webinar, you may want to also check out our massively popular two-part webinar series that Lori presented earlier this year on how to assess your CER for MDR readiness. You'll find those recordings on our website under the resources page. If you have more questions on the content we discussed today or would like to learn more about our services, you can still get your free appointment with Lori for joining us today. Our contact information is consult at criterionedge.com. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available very soon after on the website. And we'll also send it out to you in an email with the slides as well. And uh, before you guys sign off, uh, when you do sign off, you'll be prompted to fill out a quick two question survey for us. Please do uh, do that for us. It'll give us some feedback and, and just help us out. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Lori, and everybody have a wonderful day.